Joshua Boucher represents District 44 in Fargo in the North Dakota House of Representatives. Dear Mr. Boucher, my name is Tammy and I am a parent of three, ages 21, 19, and 15, and I have also been a teacher for the past 24 years. I have always prided myself in teaching my own children, as well as my students, not to discriminate against others for any reason, and we've talked often about how we make others feel. We stress in our school system the importance of treating others with respect and dignity, as well as equality. After finding out that the legislature defeated the bill regarding discrimination due to sexual orientation, I was quite discouraged with the direction we in North Dakota are going and the message we are sending to not only those in North Dakota, but those across our great nation. My son, who is 21, attends X University and is currently a junior there majoring in mathematics. This past May, he revealed to our family that he is gay. He is a brilliant young man and at one time wanted to return to North Dakota to pursue a career. This past Christmas, when he was home in North Dakota, he made a comment that broke my heart. His comment was one that he doesn't belong in North Dakota. And the defeat of this bill only endorses this belief of how unaccepting we are of people's differences especially when it comes to sexual orientation. I recently read a book entitled Prairie Silence, written by Melanie Hoffert from Winemere, North Dakota. If you have not read this book, I strongly encourage you to do so. She does a wonderful job relating her story of how difficult it was to be silent in fear of being judged, and after over 20 plus years of silence, she decided to reveal her sexual orientation through her book. As I read the book, I was saddened by the reality that my son will deal with many of the hurts and pains that Melanie deals with, and I'm sure many of the same hurts and pains you dealt with as a child and as an adult. When my older two children were looking at colleges, there was a lot of talk about how to keep young people as well as some of our most talented people in our state. I can tell you that the defeat of this bill is not going to help them stay. I, for one, do not want my son to feel silenced and I surely do not want him to be in a state where he feels as though he is not welcome. A strong message has been sent, and unfortunately, it goes against everything we believe in North Dakota. We in North Dakota teach our children from an early age to accept others and their differences, and now legislation has sent a message contrary to our teachings. Some may say it is because of our strong religious upbringings, but I challenge that with something I heard a priest say years ago. He said, Whenever you are in a situation and are unsure of what to do, ask yourself what Jesus would do, and you will always find the answer. North Dakota has lost a brilliant young man to ignorance and prejudice, and this saddens me greatly how many other young people are making this choice to remain silent like Melanie, or to find shelter outside of our state like my son. Perhaps no one will ever know the answer, but my prayers are that someday we may truly be accepting of everyone despite our differences. Finally, thank you for your work on the bill. May you find the strength and guidance you need to continue educating others. Sincerely, Tammy. Tammy's letter was one I received regularly from a lot of parents throughout North Dakota during this last session. Uh, kind of getting the claim to fame in our state of being elected the first openly gay legislature, legislator in North Dakota came with a lot of perks and a lot of harm. Um, not all letters were written to me as supportive as, as Tammy's were, um, but as much as I keep Tammy's letter to keep me moving forward to make sure that North Dakota is the state that we say we are, uh, I, I save those other letters too because those are as motivating as this one is. We often talk about politics, and as some of you are probably well aware, politics is personal. <clears throat> I grew up in Minot, 90 miles or 110 miles north of here. Uh, in a, in a m modern middle-class family, uh, my mom's a nurse, my dad's a construction laborer, uh, three boys in our household. I grew up uh, in a community that we didn't talk about sexuality. Uh, I, I didn't know what the word gay meant, um, and, and that's something that we're still working through in our state and, and continuing those conversations. The only thing I had to relate to what being gay was, was Ellen DeGeneres had come out, um, and I didn't think I reflected Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, and then Jack from Will and Grace, who was more of a small, effeminate man uh, who liked show tunes. And I'm not small, 
uh, nor did I consider myself effeminate. So I did not see myself in Jack. Uh, so it was challenging growing up. I, I attended a Catholic school, Bishop Bryan High School, where uh, a great deal of my formative years were spent in, in my foundation of my Catholic faith at that time. I'd actually considered becoming a priest at one point. Uh, I enjoyed going to church on Saturdays with my grandmother. Um, and then when I went to North Dakota State University, continued attending church at the Newman Center there. But as I started to question who I was uh, and, and not have the answers beyond a simple, at that time, a Yahoo search, that was well before Google had come along, uh, you know, I, I didn't have people to reach out to. And, and so when I, I consider the badge that I wear as the first openly gay legislator in North Dakota, it, I know that, that my ninth grade self and mine at North Dakota had I had someone like me to look up to, or a business leader in our community, or a faith leader, uh, things may have been different. I, uh, I attended NDSU. Uh, my intentions were to major in veterinary science, uh, pre-veterinary. My uncles owned vet hospitals in Fargo, and every summer we went and watched castrations and declawing, and you know. So I thought, hey, that looks like a fun job. <laughs> but. When I got to college, I realized I wanted to work with people, and I, and I really didn't have a direction. So when I picked up the, the, major, the book with all the majors in it, I, I picked political science because I liked student council in high school. Uh, so I went through three and a half years of college not knowing what a Democrat or a Republican was, a Green Party or an Independent. I just knew people yelled at each other a lot. Uh, so I, my political identity actually didn't develop until well after my social justice identity had developed through anti-racism work uh, I was doing at NDSU. Uh, and, and then I had the opportunity to leave North Dakota for a few months. I uh, did an internship at the University of Tennessee during my graduate school. Uh, I have my master's in education and so during that summer I went down and, and helped advise the orientation leaders at the University of Tennessee. Uh, we had 27 orientation leaders, and that was a, a groundbreaking year for those, that group because the orientation leaders at University of Tennessee is the premier leadership program on campus. Thousands of students vie for those spots to be one of 27 to welcome the new class. Uh, and there's a lot of traditions that have, have been passed on from that group. So ha working with them, also during that group, one of the, the reason it was groundbreaking is that they had nine African-American students as part of that group. Nearly 35% of University of Tennessee's uh, student population were African American. And so to have that number of students of color uh, in a leadership position welcoming students was pretty profound. But during that summer, by being away from home and, and being away from who I thought I had to be as far as a student leader on campus and what people thought of, uh, of who I was and the conflict I had with what being gay would mean with that, uh, I had a lot of time for self-reflection. And, and during, of those student leaders, three of those students came out to us during that summer. And the most impactful student was Tim. Tim was a tall, uh, is a tall African American student. And his biggest fear when he came out to us on, on his last night of summer uh, with us all together was that he was going home to his hometown in Mississippi and going to tell his family. And his fear of the violence that could come from that uh, within his experience in the African American community of, of being gay and what that meant, uh, especially a religious family. And so I really thought to myself, as you work with students and you work on campus, you talk about authentic leadership and, and being congruent with your values, but you aren't being congruent, Josh. And if you think about the fact that you didn't have a role model when you were going through school in Minot or at NDSU, you need to become that role model. So I made the decision when I came back to Fargo, I was going to come out. The challenge there was I had been dating a woman for eight months. Uh, so I first had to talk to Mandy uh, and tell her it just wasn't going to work anymore. Um, we're still good friends, so we, we maintained through that. But that was challenging, to not only tell yourself in, a, in an environment where you don't see other people like you uh, that you are gay and what does that mean, but even more challenging is saying it to other people. So I picked the person I was going to tell, my friend Kara, who runs a program at NDSU and advises a lot of the LGBT students. And, uh, you know, the day came and it passed. I set a new day. It came and it passed. Uh, and unfortunately, during that same time, I started really misusing alcohol. Because then alcohol could be the reason I was going to say these things. 
Uh, and we see a lot within the LGBT community an increased usage of, of alcohol and other drugs uh, to, to kind of drown out that pain of, of not feeling accepted uh, or not being able to be congruent with their family life or their work life. And so I also had fallen into that trap. So once I, I was able to come out to some friends and to some coworkers, uh, you know, my journey kind of into LGBT equality work in North Dakota began. Uh, I worked on an on-campus program where we trained faculty and staff and students on how to be allies. It provided a safe space for them to ask questions that they may not have had another space to ask. Uh, so it, it became a lot of fun and, and the ability to talk about my experiences through that. Fast forward a couple years, I, I start working in politics. I'd read a great book uh, by a man who then was Senator of Illinois, uh, The Audacity of Hope. And I really, prior to that, was not involved in, in the, the political system. Uh, I still had not formed my uh, political identity. Uh, like I said, I, I had a social justice identity as far as anti-racism and poverty work. So that led me more into uh, the democratic ideology, which uh, a member of the party I'm a part of now. And uh, so after reading his book, I really felt inspired that government can help people. Uh, that if we step up and be the leaders and, and run for office or support leaders who also share those values, that things will get better for people. And so I started working on campaigns of people who supported LGBT people. They weren't gay themselves, but they, they had values in which that they understood that we need to protect people in their houses and in their employment and, and in their faith life. <clears throat> and uh, next thing I found myself as a candidate myself. Uh, running for office this last year, and I, and I was nervous. I was scared, you know, to, to have lived an openly gay life, openly gay life, um, and then to run for office and put yourself out there. You know, the vulnerability that comes with running for office, uh, the, the things that people are going to learn about you and maybe say about you, you grow a really quick, uh, thick skin. Uh, but the, the, the dynamic part of that was, was I didn't receive any horrible things from North Dakotans. It was actually a guy from Virginia who started some website about Josh Boucher bringing the gay agenda to Bismarck. And I guess maybe he was right. I'm here talking to you all in Bismarck <laughs> about LGBT equality. Um, but, and I actually wrote him a thank you note because I raised $2,000 off of his website. <laughs> but, um, it was three weeks out from the election when I actually have the, the, this oh crap moment where I was like, I'm, I might win. Like I, I was running for office, but I never really kind of, I mean, yeah, I ran because I thought we could win, but the whole idea of running was to talk about issues that were important to me. And it was more than just LGBT equality. It was about, uh, you know, several of the school districts in my, or schools in my school district have uh, low poverty families, um, or family, families in high poverty. Um, you know, we have, I worked in higher education, we have this great opportunity to capture our talent of our young people and keep them here and, and, and not only learn from our energy sector, but also to develop other primary sector uh, employment opportunities. So those were the things that really drove me. Uh, but of course, a lot of focus came about me being gay. Uh, so I used that as an opportunity to talk about those issues so that I could educate more people. And, and like I said, three weeks out from the election, I had the old crap moment of, well, if you get elected, you gotta do something. Uh, can't do like come up with some of my colleagues and just show up and sit down every once in a while. So, uh, I don't know if any of my colleagues are here, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I got elected uh, and, and, and I'm proud of that and it, and it completely changed my perspective on, you know, my responsibility to not only myself and my family and, and the people close to me, but to my state and, and of course the district that elected me. Uh, and, and so we started the conversation again of introducing um, a, a bill in the North Dakota legislature. But before I talk about some of the equality stuff, oftentimes when I talk about LGBT equality, I always want to bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, some of you have heard a similar presentation before, um, and those of you that are educators and sociologists are very familiar with this. But what Maslow's, Mas, Abraham Maslow was a psychologist, um, and, and he had developed this hierarchy of needs that essentially said, in order for us to be full individuals, full human beings at self-actualization, we had to continue to build a foundation. So that foundation is uh, physiological, our access to air, 
to food, to water, the things that we need to sustain our human bodies. Once we've reached that foundation, uh, we move more into concern about our safety. Um, and that might be physical safety, uh, housing, uh, access to food that not only nourishes us, but also allows us to, to grow and be sustained more. Once we as humans have that safety taken care of, then we have the capacity to, to love and to feel belonged to and belonging of other people. We can enter into relationships, uh, both personal relationships and intimate relationships. And as we develop that, we, we move into esteem. We feel good about ourselves. We're, we, we identify that we have more to give of ourselves to other people and can be more productive in our communities. And finally, self-actualization, that we are part of a bigger picture. Uh, we are more than just ourselves. We are some of many parts. Um, and so when I talk about policies and developing of our, our, our political world, I always come back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Because so much of the policy work that I worked on in this last session, and, and as it re relates directly to the LGBT community, builds off of this foundation. And so, we know that as human beings, generally, you know, we, we, we have that access to water and, and air and food, and, and we want to make sure that that access is continuing to increase, especially in the economic environment we have in our state. Um, I just finished up a two-day conference here with some some uh, state employees and, and partner organizations throughout the state who are looking at how, how do we, based on having a $1.6 billion surplus this last session, lift 27,000 families out of poverty in North Dakota? Because relatively, 27,000 families is, is a small number compared to the rest of the United States. So how do we become the leader in doing that? What does that look like? What kind of policies do we need to look at and, and research and information do we need to know to to make effective policy decisions. Um, so we're working on, on that for everybody, but from an LGBT perspective, a lot of people are stuck in that safety issue. A, a lot of our young people, Tammy's son, doesn't want to come back to our state because he's afraid of, of losing his job or being kicked out of his apartment because there's no protections from that. Doesn't mean it happens all the time. I, I can tell you it does happen, but it's, there's no protections for that individual. The, the protections technically fall on the landlord or the, the employer and their right to be able to do that. And so that's why we introduced legislation to start that conversation. A lot of people, because the nation had evolved much faster than North Dakota as far as a policy standpoint. We were talking about marriage in states like Minnesota and, and federally with the Supreme Court case, um, but North Dakota is one of 28 other states in which you can still be fired for being gay or perceived of being gay or transgender. And so while we're having a conversation about marriage, there's still 28 other states where people are like, great, I can get married, but doesn't mean I have a job the day after I get married or, or can keep my apartment. Um, so we're having that conversation and, and, and looking at what does that look like here in North Dakota. So. Beyond me, there's more than just me as far as openly gay people in North Dakota, and I'm sure many of you are aware of that. Um, but the 2010 census was the first time the federal government started looking at, okay, we talk about LGBT people, who are they, where are they, and how do we start addressing some of these needs? Um, so on the 2010 census, there wasn't a question that said, are you gay? Uh, but there was a question, because uh, there's the short form that many of you filled out. Some of you might have filled out that lengthy one, and some of you might have had someone come harass you for 10 days until you answered the questions on their iPad. Um, but what all that did was find us information in North Dakota of people who self-identified. There was 559 same-sex couples identified. Of that, 146 identified their, their same-sex partner as a husband or a wife. 413 others just identified basically the gender or the sex of, of the other head of household uh, based on that form. Now, I know based on, on my networks and the people I work with that there's many more than 559 couples in North Dakota. We know this was the first time the question had been asked uh, on the census, but we do know also that through research that there's a vast amount of underreporting because of fear, people's fear of being discriminated. Even though the census worker is sworn to confidentiality and it goes into some lockbox somewhere, um, people still fear for their, their personal safety. So 
We had 559, I'll call them brave couples in North Dakota who, who filled out this survey honestly. Um, and of that, it broke down the top three counties are, are there and it's probably kind of expected. People would think Fargo area, I mean you have the largest municipality in, in the state and the, and the largest population in a county uh, with 183 couples identified, 68 in Grand Forks, and then 75 right here in Burley County. And I think this is important to talk about not only from the fact that we all know more than likely a gay person. Um, we, we've come a long way as far as people feeling comfortable coming out and, and that the coming out process in itself is political because in 10 years we've gone from ballot initiatives that define marriage and relationship recognitions as one man and one woman to defeating those at the ballot box and at the ballot box actually allowing people to have marriage equality and their relationship recognized by the government. So 10 years is pretty fast um, and, and I always try to remind my LGBT fellow leaders and people in the community that we have a lot of privilege in our community compared to our peers, um, when, especially when we look at the civil rights movements in the 60s and gender equality that's been going on since Adam and Eve. Um, but a lot of that privilege comes from the fact that as LGBT people, you know, I get the badge that says first openly gay legislator in North Dakota. There's more of me out there. It's just they don't feel comfortable being out for a variety of reasons. Maybe it's not being reelected, or it's a family reason, or it's their job. Um, but we know that that power of coming out is political in the fact that it, it informs our family. I can tell you my family makes different decisions in how they vote and who they support and the conversations they have because I have come out to them. It took them a while to, to appreciate the new me, quote unquote, and then I tell everyone, every one of my students that when they come out to remember, you know, it took me 23 years to come out to myself, so you can give your family a year to adjust. Um, it's okay. But unfortunately, that's not a reality for a lot of people, and that's why we see an increased rate of homelessness amongst LGBT youth. Our homeless shelters in Fargo, the youth there, about 55% of them identify as LGBT or questioning. Um, and it, a lot of it's associated with they were kicked out of the home and they didn't have another family member to go to. But coming out is political, so that personal is, is, is political. And, and so we're seeing that while progress is happening in other parts of the United States, states like North Dakota are left behind. And, and part of that privilege of, of keeping secret part of who we are has allowed many of us to get in positions of power. You know, I, I think if Dr. Roberts, we talk about, you know, President Barack Obama being the first African-American man elected to office, and, and we have to remember that President Obama is a biracial man. You know, he's not 100% African-American, and so would that have changed things of, of his election? But, but President Obama or, or Dr. Roberts can't hide to the rest of the world who they are and the assumptions that come on to those things. I potentially could have. We have lawmakers in our state and, and, and high-ranking officials and agencies and, and children of, of our politicians that are able to do that. Um, and so the coming out is, is important because it informs the people around us uh, in our workplaces, in our faith lives, uh, in our communities of who we are. And so I think it's important that we provide a space and we, we, we have these conversations throughout our state because it's not just progress in Fargo is good enough. People from Fargo are from somewhere else in North Dakota. Tammy's son is from rural North Dakota. And we should be able, we want our families to come back. And that's why I think one of the important things, in 2009 when we introduced the non-discrimination bill, it was much, well, everyone can agree that this last legislative session there wasn't much collegiality going on. Um, but 2009, it was, a, it was a bipartisan conversation. It was, there was an equal number of Republicans who supported the bill as there were Democrats who opposed it in 2009. That's very much unlike a lot of the other states where it's very split ideologically. We saw more of that split this session in 2013. <clears throat> but the reason it was bipartisan in 2009 was because the Republicans who stood up to support the bill talked about their gay brother, their gay grandson, their lesbian sister. And so that that informed their decision and their understanding and so that's why it's important that we, we provide space, whether it's our workplace or our places of worship, in which LGBT people can be themselves. 
And, and I can tell you there's a lot of places in this state that people don't feel that that's an option for them. And they, and they live in fear and, and it, it's come to a place now where some employers, I, I've heard back from people, <clears throat> employers are having people sign contracts that say you will not, you know, if you want to work here, you need to agree to these things and one of those things is you will not openly support LGBT people. And so we're seeing what I would say is a regression. And, and part of that regression is in 2009, when we introduced the non-discrimination bill, <clears throat> it was, you know, passed the Senate pretty closely, and there was a healthy conversation in the House. But four years later, with the advanced support of the North Dakota Chamber of Commerce, the North Dakota Association of Realtors, an increased number of people of faith and faith leaders coming to support this bill and understanding the importance to North Dakotans, we couldn't get it past the Senate. Uh, and so I tell people that while the rest of the states or the United States is moving forward, North Dakota unfortunately is regressing. And, and I think there's a, there's a reason for that. I, I think it's a function of not only obviously the people who are in the decision making seats and, and who we elect to represent us, but more so that some of those people just feel like because there's progress elsewhere, we got to hold on here. And, and because of that, we're going to see more North Dakotans leave. Not just LGBT people, but people who support and are allies to or family of or, or friends of. Um, I can tell you that from an economic development standpoint, uh, we know that there's employers who have had an opportunity to come to North Dakota, but because of some of our social policies, they've switched, they found a different state. Because their employees aren't protected. Part of my ability to come out was the fact that I attended North Dakota State University. North Dakota State University in 1993 uh, in amended its non-discrimination policy to include sexual orientation. So as a student and an employee, I knew that at least, you know, they couldn't kick me out of class or kick me out of the dorms or not let me be part of a student organization. And as an employee that I could be protected as my, in my job when I came out. <clears throat> that wasn't the reality for our other institutions. Um, I know Bismarck State College was one of the first state, uh, universe, colleges out in the western part of the state to amend their non-discrimination policy. But fortunately, the university system, recognizing that in order to be competitive for talent of researchers and faculty and, and staff, um, after the defeat of the bill in 2009, amended the, the university system uh, <coughs> non-discrimination policy to include sexual orientation. So now our 45,000 students that are part of the university system at all 11 institutions and the, the employees there are protected. But what we're doing, well that's progress and it's being made in, di in different parts as far as an employment piece uh, in, in different parts of the states, we're creating two different North Dakotas. We have a North Dakota where certain people are protected and then we have a North Dakota where they're not. And so that's the purpose of passing policies like this and, and why progress on the prairie is so important because we know that once people feel safe in their homes, uh, they're going to be more honest about who they are and they're going to be more productive in the workplace and, and more fully committed as citizens to their communities. But unfortunately, there's a lot of people who live in fear. Uh, and so, what does that look like? Um, you know, what, what we're seeing progress in nationally is three different areas primarily. Housing employment, which I talked about, uh, safe schools and youth, um, one of the leading LGBT students are three times more likely to attempt suicide than their heterosexual peers. Um, we, I think we've had a really healthy conversation nationally about bullying um, and that isn't just about LGBT, it's about a variety of other issues um, and that's continuing and so I, I commend the work of our, our educators on that and policymakers. Uh, and then in North Dakota we also in 2011 passed a piece of legislation that required schools to have an anti-bullying policy and a response plan. Um, it wasn't where we'd like to see it, but it's something to start with and, and to have the conversation at the local. And then relationship recognition. Um, I know I had a number of people reach out to me after the session that said, well, why don't we put marriage on the ballot? Minnesota got it. Do you think we get it in North Dakota? And I had to remind them that in 2004 we had marriage on the ballot, uh, and there was 73% of North Dakotans at that time who, who felt that marriage is defined between one man and one woman. 27% uh, uh, did not feel that way, that felt that people should be able to decide um, their relationship in, in the, in their, between their families and their God, and the government should stay out of it. Um, but 
But the thing, the Minnesota model was that in 1983, Minnesota passed the most inclusive housing ordinance, uh, which included sexual orientation, gender identity. Wisconsin was the first state to pass sexual orientation as a protected class in employment and housing. Minnesota came along a few years later and also included gender identity. And so that's why you hear the model, uh, you know, for a lot of people is why, why are gay people wanting to be associated or part of the community with transgender individuals? And it's just, we've, we've always been a community uh, since in our oppression uh, through the systems and, and by society, and so we continue to stick together. But federally, there's the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. So essentially what we're doing is, is we're asking that, similar to categories like race and religion, age, family status, that people, regardless of their talents or their ability to do their work, are at least protecting their employment based on how they identify or who they call family. Um, you know, people should... Employers can have the right to hire and fire people based on their capabilities and their knowledge and, and so forth, but when it comes to those factors, you know, we want to make sure that people feel safe in their workplace and in their homes. So the Employment Non-Discrimination Act has been introduced in 15 different Congresses, um, and in 2007, it made the farthest that it's ever been. In 2007, it was introduced into the um, House of Representatives, but in the middle of the night, uh, Barney Frank, who was at that time the only openly gay congressperson uh, from Massachusetts uh, made a deal because it included gender identity at that time and, and, and the powers that be in the advocacy groups recognize that they may not have the votes if it includes gender identity, but they have the votes if it includes sexual orientation. So the bill showed up the next day, gender identity was scrapped from it, it was just sexual orientation and, and policymakers said we'll come back and get our transgender friends and family next time. Well, that created a great schism nationally around groups and saying, you know, we're one community, we need to work together, um, and, and how, you know, it it's, takes a lot of privilege for a gay man to make that decision on behalf of the transgender community. Um, and so we, it passed the House, uh, but the Senate decided to let it die on the floor. Um, they had the votes to pass that form of the bill, but they didn't want to keep the current divide. And at that time, President Bush had said that he would veto the bill anyway, so they didn't want to continue that that hurt. And so the bill has been introduced since, and now it's currently in the, introduced in the Senate uh, with 53 co-sponsors bipartisanly. So there's two Republicans on there right now, um, and our own Senator Heidkamp is a co-sponsor of that, and we're working on Senator Hoven uh, as well. But ideally, if it passes at the federal level, that's going to trickle down to the state level. Now, we get a lot of people who say, well, why pass employment non-discrimination for something that people choose or can change. You know, I know someone who, you know, Josh, you dated a woman for a while, then you came out and, and now you're a gay man. What if someone wants to go back to being straight or live a straight lifestyle? Um, in, in my, that's a, that's a path people want to go down and I think it's a dangerous path because we have to recognize that other factors of who we are and our identities are protected and they change. Our age changes, our family status changes, our religion and spirituality could change. There are factors such as certain disabilities in, in our race and so forth, ethnicity that don't change, uh, but we, we as a society have said that we recognize that there are certain people who continue to be oppressed and discriminated against. And so as a, as a community, as the United States of America, we, we don't stand for that. Um, and so we need to make sure bills like that continue moving forward if, if we're not able to pass them at the state level. I can tell you progress, what it looks like now, and, and many of you are, are probably aware if you've read the papers. Uh, the city of Fargo and the city of Grand Forks are moving forward with as, as best of a non-discrimination ordinance as they can because uh, they recognize that they have many employers who have these protections. But the reality is, is, as someone who worked at NDSU, or if I worked at Microsoft, or Target, or Wells Fargo, any of these other businesses that have these protections for their employees, the minute I cross the street, those protections are no longer there for me. So I might live on campus my freshman year as a student, but then I'm going to live off campus my second semester, and the landlord doesn't want me living with my boyfriend, so I can be kicked out uh, with no notice. Uh, and, and be homeless, especially when we know, all know or are very well aware of the, the fact that there's not very many apartments available to rent. They're extremely high in rent. Um, and so we're kicking people out at a time where we're seeing increased homelessness already uh, throughout our state. But Minnesota, or, uh, Fargo and Grand Forks are, are working on that. And um, 
trying to move it forward. As far as relationship recognition, I think a lot of people have questions about what does the Supreme Court decisions that were made this last June mean for North Dakota. Uh, it means two different things. <clears throat> people who are legally married in a jurisdiction uh, in which uh, uh, their relationship is recognized, so right now that could be the state of Minnesota, it could be Canada, it could be another country. There are five tribes in the United States that recognize uh, marriage equality. Uh, then the federal government will recognize that relationship for IRS, for VA, uh, for Social Security, uh, immigration. <coughs> But what it means from a state perspective is uh, the, the decision of, of uh, Perry um, versus the state of California, or I forget how that's broken out, but the Proposition 8 one was that the Supreme Court said it's a state-by-state -state issue for right now, because uh, right now there's currently 13 states in which uh, the same-sex marriage is allowed. There's an additional seven states in which domestic partnerships and civil unions are allowed, so a form of that recognition, separate but equal. Um, is the law of the land there. And so I think we're going to continue to see progress, but with that progress I think it'll be interesting to see what states like North Dakota and South Dakota, Montana, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas do um, in their, their desire to continue to hold on while the rest of the, state, the United States is making progress. And, and the reality of what that means is we're going to be losing families. We're going to lose fourth generation farmers and business owners who decide that I don't want to live here anymore if, I, if, if who I am is not respected and at least protected when it comes to my employment or my housing um, or who I love is defined in the children that we have and, and the families that we, we build. And so, you know, it's going to take uh, a lot of work, but I'm not overwhelmed by that and I know that there's a lot of people uh, that are, are doing that work in different areas. So I encourage you to really just think about where can you make an impact. You don't have to run for office. And, and for the state legislature, however, if you're interested, I'll love to talk to you during lunch. We could use a few more people out there, or here. Um, but, you know, what conversations happen in your workplace? What conversations in your school or in your place of worship uh, in which you can identify how are we a more inclusive and welcoming community? As someone who grew up Catholic and, and has left the church uh, and now actually just recently, a couple months ago, with the Presentation Sisters in Fargo, I've been starting a, a formation uh, to, to learn about more about coming back to the church, which is important to me. I couldn't be more happy than, than the Pope's comments the other day about what does it mean about judgment and who are we to judge and that when we, we need as a church to go back to the gospel of Jesus and, and talk more about what was Jesus teaching and, and get over some of these policy issues and, and rebuild our church from that. And so I, I think we're going to see an, a more inclusive uh, at least Catholic Church. We've seen in some Lutheran denominations that conversation occur nationally, the Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, uh, and of course the Unitarians. They've always been there, you know. So, but, but I'm excited for the progress that will happen, and, and I know in partnership with, with, with people like some of you, uh, we'll see that, and we'll be able to retain our talent and retain our young people and our families here in North Dakota. So I know we have about two minutes left for questions. Otherwise, I'll also take them on the panel. Any questions? We do have a panel at the end where all of the speakers will uh, be around for about an hour and a half. And so there will be an opportunity to ask questions that might generate some interest between the conversations as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just had a question about the bill that was voted down. Mm -hmm. um, what was the overall um, rationale for people who didn't support the bill? For why it, they didn't want it to pass? Uh, primarily it was a religious reason um, for both the lawmakers and the people who opposed the bill. Um, and that was very much, you know, it's interesting being someone as part of the minority party here in North Dakota. So I, I didn't know if I should start with is, I don't know if it's more dynamic that it's, I'm an openly gay legislator or I'm a Democrat. Uh, but <laughs> it was interesting because part of our strategy was we wanted to make sure that we had North Dakotans speak into our lawmakers. So we went and visited with faith leaders and business leaders and, and people who have been discriminated against and they shared those stories and talked about their perspective. 
but the people that opposed, I mean, there was some religious leaders that opposed it, and, and some people from a religious perspective. But it was interesting because they were allowed to bring in three groups from outside of North Dakota to dictate that conversation. Um, and, and I know had I brought in groups from Washington, D.C. or New York to lobby on behalf of it would have been, why are you bringing these outside groups to change North Dakota? And, and so it's really interesting, this dich dichotomy of, because I'm in the minority party and we strongly supported this bill, that um, we weren't allowed to bring some experts from outside. We had, our experts were North Dakotans. And so beyond the religious conversation, it was outside groups came in and, and put fears in uh, of our, some of our lawmakers. So. Joshua, thank you very much for uh, being a leader and a role model.